Okay, we left off last time in Colossians 3 in We had noticed that we had died with Christ, but were commanded to mortify. And I, I pointed out that this uh, connects our theological, spiritual position. We're in Christ and we're dead. With our personal and practical position. That is that we, we must live out that death. <clears throat> which is counterintuitive because a dead man doesn't have to do anything to act like a dead man. Okay? It's a passive existence, whereas spiritually, that dead man has to be actively put off. Okay? So, just another example of where you have to allow the text to inform your understanding of a metaphor rather than your own experience or pre-understanding. He goes from mortifying specific, uh, what we would kind of like obvious outbroken sins to more sins of the spirit, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication. Okay. How do you put off anger? Let's start with the text. Okay. But that's a metaphor too. How do you put on the new self? Okay. So we've got prayer. We've got acquisition of knowledge. But anger... Anger is uh, not a belief. I don't change my belief about anger and thereby change my getting angry. Okay, I change my belief about the things that I get angry about. <laughs> So, think to the last time that you were angry. Okay. And then ask yourself, what beliefs do I have that formed the soil out of which my anger grew? Or maybe a better metaphor would be a chemist shop were the compounds that got mixed and caused the explosion. Okay. Well, uh, let's see if I can remember the last time I got angry. It's not been that long ago, but I can't remember it. Um, but, so let me give you an example of a time I, I, I do remember. I was on the highway and uh, it had started, uh, you know, maybe a foot of my car's movement in the direction of an off-ramp, but I was still within my lane. And uh, I realized I didn't want to get off that off-ramp. And just as I moved to correct to come back in the center of my lane, a big monster truck is laying on the horn and running right smack into the spot that I would be coming back to and forced me right off the lane. I mean, I just, I, no, no choice, off the lane I go. And I was furious. And I had about 15 seconds of intense scenario running of things to say and uh, expressions of my fury at being unceremoniously dumped off the highway simply because that guy wanted to change lanes. And uh, then the Lord started talking to me. 
and helped me to say, okay, what I believed was I have a right not to be treated that way. Well, it may be true that it's not right to treat me that way, but is it true that I have a right not to be treated that way? Then the Lord said something to me like, why is it that you're cursing, you know, not cuss words, but saying choice things about this person rather than blessing them? Because I say you're supposed to bless those who mistreat you. Okay. Well, God, I'm very angry because he's inconveniencing me. Now I got to go down to the next turn around, turn off, get back on. You know, good grief. So, and you start looking th through your belief structure that brought about the anger. Okay. And, and examining it biblically. I think this is the method for putting off anger. This is the method for putting off wrath. So anything that's emotional in its focus has to be addressed first by seeing its, its uh, conceptual or cognitive roots. Uh, I, remember, I remember being down here at the end of uh, Young Street and uh, whatever this other street is here. You know, but and I, was, I was furious. I'm thinking to myself, why am I so upset? I mean, I'm just like... And I realized it was because I had a fear that the administration was going to take the school in a wrong direction. And that fear then <coughs> had me reacting <coughs> not to real situations, but to possible situations, what if this, what if that, what if the other, and getting all upset about the things that weren't real, rather than reverting back to God is sovereign, and so he's in control of the people, and I have access to him, and, you know, working through uh, a, a, a four pillars approach to potential fear or problem rather than a flesh driven well I'll say this and I'll do that and this and, and push this lever button pull that lever and so on so what I, I what I, I hope you're hearing me say is I'm not just talking about anger I'm talking about how sanctification gets actualized in our lives. And what you didn't hear me say was go to the altar and put off anger. Yeah. Is there anything that you I believe that there are always thought process behind it. The experience of pain is non-cognitive. 
it's neurological. Okay? You have nerves, they get squashed, they send signals, the brain experiences pain. Okay? That's not cognitive. The processing of pain is cognitive. What does this mean about me? What does this mean about them? What kind of responses? And sometimes we have to dig a long way back and say, well, you know, well, you know, at some point in time, I got hit in the face and it was humiliating or it was demeaning or it was depersonalizing or it was something that I found very negative. And so even though I haven't consciously thought it through, that triggers that event again. And then I have to go back and reprocess the event biblically and then build in. So you, you've all experienced hearing a sound, maybe it's music or some other sound, and being in a place. And then you hear the sound again and boom, you're back in the place. Right? Well, you've got, that's a mental association thing. You can't control the initial creation of the association, but you can return and process that association and build around it a new framework. And uh, that's essentially what I'm talking about, that in many of these more emotion or involuntary or unconscious reaction things that we sense about ourselves that's not like Jesus and I shouldn't be that way and why am I this way do I just need to go pray and ask God to help me not be this way well yes you should pray but you should also then start saying how, how should I think biblically about this Jesus was slapped in the face by guards how was it that he was able to be like a lamb Spit on him, pulling his beard. You know, I mean, don't. So, one caution about this. My caution is: don't look into your grace tank and say, "I don't have enough grace for that kind of treatment." I don't have dying grace. I don't have torture grace. I don't have I couldn't handle it. Well, God doesn't give you the grace for what he doesn't allow you to experience. So, rather than saying <coughs> I don't have grace, a person should say I trust God that in the event that that happened he would give me grace, but now he wants me to think this way. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Let them leap for joy. Look at Peter and John walking out of having been beaten with rods, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer. That's not a way that I think about suffering. Worthy to suffer. Only worthy people suffer. Wow. Lord, this is, this is your perspective. If you let me suffer, you have honored me. <laughs> Why is God doing this to me? Right? Deal with it. Um, 
especially, for instance, in my case, I'm not in, the, I'm not in a position that I can go talk to that person who's not fulfilling the responsibility. That's not my authority level. And, you know, but how do you deal with a situation where you can't, you know, other people are being in a bad situation because of others lack of responsibility? That's a big topic. It's one of the least developed areas of expertise in holiness circles. And uh, it's an area that I'm still uh, a student in. I still have my lab coat on and I'm running experiments. <laughs> so I, I do not have a finished product to offer you. However, I think I have some of the main principles. Number one, I have to assume the best about others. Number two, I have to, assuming the best about others, integrate Matthew 7, Lumberjacking with Matthew 18, confrontation. Uh, is there anything that I've done that uh, wasn't, did I fail to make clear that it had to be done by this time? Did I uh, not provide you with the resources? Is there anything I can do to help you? Help me understand what's going on here. Followed up by the second stage of Matthew 18 looks like in a work situation, I go to a manager who is over the person who's not performing their job and saying, here's the conversation I had with them. Here's the response that I had. Is there anything that we can, can be done about this from your perspective? If I'm a manager, uh, it's learning how to chop the uh, rebuke bologna loaf at the proper slicing level. There's fine slicing, there's gradations and then there's hitting them with the whole bologna loaf okay. and I got real help from a guy who's a who was a 25 year oil company manager he said if it's a small thing talk to him about it on Monday if it's a medium level thing talk to him about it on Wednesday if it's a big thing talk to him about it on Friday and let him stew over it the whole weekend on Monday, if it's small, they can make corrections and by the end of the week be getting a pat on the back. If it's bigger, they've only got two days to get things straightened out, Wednesday. Friday, they can do nothing to fix it, and they got to deal with the fact that they had a brick dropped on them the whole weekend. But he said, you should never say in an evaluation meeting things that they have not already heard before, which is completely contrary to the way our subculture handles things. We want to be nice, 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 and I can't stand being nice anymore, so boom! This and 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 this. When it should have been this when it happened. That's only some of the ingredients. That's not a complete that's not a complete solution, but that's part of where I'm at. Alright. We'll have our last class on Monday. Is that right? Regular classes are Monday.